Grateful for our kids, grateful for those who are meeting them downstairs, grateful for all of our workers. And it is a high, intense ministry with lots of volunteers needed. So we're really grateful for all of those who have stepped in and stepped up. And so it is a good thing that we have them with us. Well, I'm looking forward today to hearing from my friend, longtime pastor Lee Eklov. He is one of the gifts that God has given us. And he, yeah, give him a warm welcome. Love that. So grateful every time he speaks. It's a wonderful, marvelous thing. And I'm glad that he said yes uh, again for us. Love you, buddy. <laughs> so, um, and so we're grateful for your ministry, grateful for his ministry. And he actually speaks all over the place. So when they're typically not here, he's off somewhere speaking. So if you speak, um, excuse me, if you pray for us here, pray for him, pray for others who are out ministering. And um, uh, he has a great opportunity um, to speak to groups of pastors. So he's connected up with preaching today, Christianity today. And it's interesting as a pastor, I get these ads and like, here's Lee's face there. And he's meeting with pastors around the country. They're doing so virtually right now to encourage them, to equip them, to connect with them. And so his ministry goes beyond this place. He's here with us and it's, it's beyond us among us as well. So grateful for you, grateful for the message today. And uh, let's tune in and dial up and look forward to what God would share with us. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, David. We really love our church. We're glad we can. I'm really glad I get to do this, and I'm really glad I get to do this uh, particular passage. Dave and I had talked about, we always talk about preaching. We meet almost every week if we're able to, and uh, spend two or three hours together. Uh, he's so messed up. It just takes so much work. <laughs> Oops, I shouldn't have let that slip, I guess. Uh, no, we just have a great time talking about preaching and pastoring and about you and <laughs> the work that we are called to do. So it's, uh, it's a delight. Uh, allow me to pray. Father, your uh, word is powerful, and I'm grateful for it. The things that you tell us here, we would never figure out ourselves. And we'd never even want to or seek to if it wasn't that you draw us to yourself. Uh, I pray for your help today. I pray that I would be lucid and, and clear for your people. And I pray that you would speak to those who feel invisible. In Jesus' name, amen. If you have a Bible, I hope you do. I know we always put the words up here, but it's good to have a Bible. And uh, if you have one, turn to Genesis 16. We're in this series on the life of Abraham, and we come to Genesis 16 today. Let me just say, this is a hot mess of a story. It is just an awful story. So I'm going to read and stop, read and stop like that. It begins, Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. Well, that's a problem. Because God had promised them a son. God had said, a son who is your own flesh and blood will be your heir. That's what he'd said. Your own flesh and blood will be your heir. And God had said, look up at the sky and count the stars. So shall your offspring be. But Abraham, at this point, was 85 years old and no son. I don't know what was said in that household, but the burden of barrenness rested rock heavy on Sarai, who, as it says, had borne him no children. 
Well, let's read on. But she had an Egyptian slave named Hagar. In an earlier chapter, we read that Abraham and Sarah had gone to Egypt for a time, where Abraham had passed off Sarah as his sister. Remember that story? To Pharaoh. And somehow in that uh, foray to Egypt, they came back with Hagar, who was now the slave of Sarai. Reading on. So she, that Sarai, said to Abram, The Lord has kept me from having children. Go sleep with my slave. Perhaps I can build a family through her. Now, both slavery and surrogacy were acceptable in those days, in the cultures there. But you don't have to be Dr. Phil to know that this is asking for trouble. Right? Maybe Sarai wouldn't have even done this if it hadn't been for God's promise. But even without that, the idea of dying without a son was dreadful. She was 75 at this point. Perhaps she thought there was a verse in the Bible somewhere, from the mouth of God somewhere, that said, God helps those who help themselves. But remember what God had said. A son who is your own flesh and blood will be your heir. Well, hmm. let me read on. Abram agreed to what Sarah said. So after Abram had been living in Canaan ten years, Sarai, his wife, I want you to catch that, his wife, took her Egyptian slave Hagar and gave her to her husband to be his wife. He slept with Hagar and she conceived. Awkward. I don't care what culture you're in. All those years with Sarai, without a child, and then, what, one night with Hagar? The glances, the blushing, counting, pregnant. It was so messy. Reading on, when she, that's Hagar, knew she was pregnant, she began to despise her mistress. Despise means to regard lightly, to treat as unimportant. Now the slave is one up on her mistress, right? Maybe Hagar made sure Sarai saw her knitting booties. Or maybe it was just that superior look in her eyes, especially of a young, pregnant woman to an old woman. But Hagar knew what she was doing. She knew how to yank on the strings. And it stung Sarai. Let me read on. Then Sarai said to Abram, You are responsible. For the wrong I am suffering. Happy Valentine's Day. I put my slave in your arms, and now that she knows she's pregnant, she despises me. May the Lord judge between you and me. <laughs> Chuck Swindoll wrote, So now Sarai appeals to the Lord. She should have done that back up in verse 1. A little late now. And now Sarah is on the outs with both Hagar and Abram. Meals must have been served on ice in that house. <laughs> Sarah blames Abram because Hagar despises her. <clears throat> Sarah 
wanted Abram to put her back in her place. It's kind of hard to do under those circumstances. And Hagar was now his wife also. Talk about a no-win situation all the way around. A hot mess, if there ever was one. Reading on, your slave is in your hands, Abram said. Do with her whatever you think best. Then Sarai mistreated Hagar, so she fled from her. Abram said, your slave is in your hands. What, what happened to wife? So Sarai mistreats the mother <coughs> of Abram's only child. The Hebrew word here suggests humiliating emotional mistreatment. It's not hard to kind of imagine what that looked like. I don't know if I could imagine what it felt like, but you can just feel the games that were being played, the, what was going on. And now it's going both ways between these two women. It gets so bad that Hagar decides she has no choice but to run away, pregnant and alone, into the desert. She heads toward Egypt. And if you want to look on a map, there's just not much between where she is and Egypt except the wilderness. She takes, it says here, the road to Shur, which is a, not a major traffic uh, road. It wasn't a major caravan road. She takes the back road. It's kind of a wilderness back alley. It's dangerous. It was populated often by bad people, thieves, and such. She's heading back to Egypt to the people who first sold her into slavery. I don't know if she had anybody there. I don't know what she was going back to, but... And back behind, Abraham is left torn between two lovers. Sarah is bitter and babyless, and her plan has gone all to pieces, hasn't it? That plan she had for a son that would be hers, really, even though it was her slaves, and Abraham's, really, and it would fulfill the promise of God, it really wasn't. It was all screwed up. What a mess. None of the three characters in this story are particularly admirable, are they? There's no heroes here. There's nobody to read and go, so be like, no, don't be like any of these people. Abram comes off in this story as dull and passive and oblivious, apparently, to the promise of God. He was, I don't know if I'd say he didn't believe it, but he didn't believe it very well. Didn't believe it much. Sarai comes off as a schemer who gets caught in her own faithless and desperate plan. And the hapless Hagar, we see her taking the very first chance she gets to lord it over Sarai. Now, as this chapter moves forward, our, our attention is focused on Hagar. We could talk this morning about what we should learn from Abraham and Sarah, but we're not going to. Because this lesson focuses now on Hagar. She wasn't perfect. We don't even really know what she believed, if she believed in the God of Abram. We don't know if she'd ever stood at one of Abram's altars and worshipped God. We don't know. She came from a different place, a different country, different gods. But she's the victim in the story, and she's the one with the story to tell. There's a painter that I really like. His name is Cody F. Miller. He's in Ohio. And I have some of his prints in my house. And I came across this painting he did. It's called Hagar. 
And it's based on these verses from Genesis 16. In his notes next to this print on his website, I was surprised to see that he quotes Ralph Ellison. Ellison famously wrote back around, I think it was around 1950, his experience as an African American in his famous book, Invisible Man. And he says this, and this is what Miller puts next to Hagar. I am an invisible man. I am a man of substance, of flesh and bone, fiber and liquids, and I might even said to possess a mind. I'm invisible, understand, simply because people refuse to see me. Well, that was Hagar's experience. I suppose as a slave, Hagar often felt like nobody saw her, that she was invisible, don't you think? But it was all the worse. It stung all the more after she slept in Abram's arms and then carried his baby only to be rejected by him and Sarah and driven off into the wilderness. Perhaps you know what it's like to feel invisible and unheard. As I prayed about this morning, I thought, oh, the stories that are hidden behind your faces in this place. Was it the home you grew up in? Did you go through a divorce that left you feeling desperately alone, forsaken? Maybe it's how you feel at school. Unheard and unseen, a nobody. Perhaps you were abused or attacked. And nobody sees that. Did someone take what was most precious to you? Perhaps death left you alone. Does it feel like no one really sees you? No one really hears you? No one really knows you? There is a kind of pain, a kind of rejection that almost seems to dissolve a person on the inside. Till we're more than lonely, till we feel empty and invisible. It's as if we were driven off into some vast, empty wilderness. As if we're on a desert road that no one else travels. And that's what it was like for Hagar. And it gets worse before it got better. Now, we're going to read on, but before I do, in any Bible story... The focus is always, we have all these characters, whatever's going on, but the focus is always on what God says or does. He's the main character. So the rest of this story is like a frame for us to see God. My hobby is matting and framing pictures. I can't paint, I can't draw, I like art. So I mat and frame pictures. It's as close as I dare get. One of the things I've learned is that depending on what frame, what mat color you put around a picture, it completely changes the way it looks. Well, this is a, a frame in the story of Hagar around a picture of God. 
Listen as I read, starting at verse 7. Uh, verse seven. The angel of the Lord found Hagar near a spring in the desert. It was the spring that's beside the road to Shur. And he said, Hagar, slave of Sarai, where have you come from? And where are you going? Big story in that, isn't there? I'm running away from my mistress, Sarai, she answered. Then the angel of the Lord told her, Go back to your mistress and submit to her. Then the angel added, I will increase your descendants so much that they will be too numerous to count. The angel of the Lord also said to her, You are now pregnant, and you will give birth to a son. You shall name him Ishmael, which means God hears. For the Lord has heard of your misery. He will be a wild donkey of a man, and a terror at two, I would guess. His hand will be against everyone, and everyone's hand against him, and he will live in hostility toward all his brothers. She gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her. You are the God who sees me. For she said, I have now seen the one who sees me. And that's why the well was called Beer Lahai Roy. It's still there. Between Kadesh and Bered. So Hagar bore Abram a son. And Abram gave him the name Ishmael to the son she had born. Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore him Ishmael. God hears and sees you when no one else does. God hears and sees you when no one else does. That first line of verse 7, the angel of the Lord found Hagar. Now, I want to make something clear. <clears throat> the word angel literally in Hebrew, just means messenger. I looked at scores of paintings of this story. And there's angels in lots of them. And every angel I saw had wings. I don't think there was a wing here. I can't find a picture without it, but I don't think there were wings. She thought it was a man. Another thing, more importantly, you noticed as I read that even though uh, it says the angel of the Lord, or the messenger of the Lord, you're hearing it's as if God has done this, as if she has seen God. I have seen the one, the living one. A lot of us think that, and a lot of scholars think that when we see this angel of the Lord in the Old Testament, it's really the son of God before he came to earth as Jesus of Nazareth. So let's imagine it that way. I don't think we're far off, if off at all. No one ever turns to God whom God hasn't found first. People will say, I found God in this way or that. I know, but actually God found you long before you were looking. Here's another thing you learn from this story. God knows you and your future far better than you know yourself. God knows you and your future far better than you know yourself. You notice all the things that the messenger of the Lord told her? About all the descendants she would have, more than she could count? By the way, that's the same kind of promise that God had made to Abram. But this isn't that son. 
he knew that the baby in her womb was a son without a sonogram. He knew that the boy's name needed to be God hears. And he knew why. He knew what that boy would be like, what his character would be, what his relationships would be. In other words, God not only found Hagar by that spring, he knew her and her future in detail. And so he knows you and me in detail. He knit each of us together in our mother's womb. He knows the days allotted. He knows the number of hairs on your head. I grew up hearing the song, His Eye is on the Sparrow, and I know he watches me. The centerpiece of this word from the Lord is this. And God says this, You shall name him Ishmael, for the Lord has heard of your misery. As I've said, Ishmael means God hears. My translation says, because God has heard of your misery. Literally, it says, because God has heard your misery. Not of your misery, as if somebody had sent a report, or even as it been in a prayer. God had heard the misery. He says the same thing to the people of Israel when they were in Egypt. God has heard, seen your misery. Same word. God has heard your misery. God hears our affliction, our misery, as though it has a voice of its own. He hears what you can't even say, what you can't find a lament for. There's no sad song that does it. God still hears it. That soundless ache of our messed up lives, of relationships gone awry, of heartbreak, of despising and being despised, of babies whose futures will be so difficult. God hears. This truth, which sat here so beautifully like a jewel, is made all the more spectacular and beautiful and full and clear in Jesus. I love a verse in Matthew 9 where it says, When Jesus saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Jesus said, come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. His disciple Peter tells us, cast all your anxiety on him, for he cares for you. You may not even know any more about God than Hagar did. But God hears your misery. In Genesis 16 there, verse 13, Hagar gave God a second name. A name with two meanings might be a better way to put it. A name with two meanings. It says, she gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her. You are the God who sees me. For she said, I have now seen the one who sees me. That's really the whole point of this story, right there. Two amazing realizations. God sees me, and I've seen the one who sees me. She wasn't alone. She wouldn't have to raise that child by herself, no matter what Sarah did. There's another story in the Bible that bears a striking resemblance to this one. And I confess, I didn't think of it till early this morning. Laying in bed, thinking, Lord, I'm missing something. 
It's, it's a story so similar to this. Another outcast woman whose life is a mess. Another well. And God appearing again incognito. Just a man. It was about noon, and it was hot. And it says in John 4, when a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? Remember it now? Remember that story? A Jew, not just a Jew, the Son of God, the Messiah of the Jews, talking to a Samaritan woman. Samaritans weren't just, it wasn't just an ethnic thing. They, they were like a cult. And she'd had five husbands. For some reason, we always seem to hold her responsible for that in a culture where women couldn't take a new husband. Men could take a new wife. I don't know what had happened there, but I can tell you this. She felt invisible. She did not feel prized. She did not feel like, how lucky am I that five men have loved me and now I have another. She did not feel that way, I can tell you that for sure. That is not the way people are wired. She was a woman who knew what it was like to feel invisible. That's why she went to the well at noon when nobody else was there. Jesus answered her, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them, in them, a spring of water welling up to eternal life. What'd she do? She ran back to her town. She went back yelling up and down the streets, I just met a man who told me everything I ever did. That was news. <laughs> she was oblivious to what people thought about her. She might just as well have said, I have seen the one who sees me. Same difference. Listen, friends, you don't have to see with your eyes to see with your heart. You can be absolutely certain that he not only sees you, but that he offers you living water. Every time you come to the well, Bir Lahai Roy, the well of the living one who sees me. I read something by Hillary Price. She's a Bible teacher. And she said this in one of her sermons. I wasn't brought up in a home that knew God, understood God, or talked about God. But when I was 10 years old, I went into my room alone and shut the door. 10 years old. And I did a very simple experiment. I clicked my fingers and looked around and I said, did anybody see that? <laughs> and I sat there. And because I heard no one answer, I came to the conclusion that there was no one there. I then lived the rest of my teenage years as though there was no one there and as though there was no God. Many years later, I discovered that God sees my secret world. God knows me. He knew me in that room. God had even written about that moment in that room in his book, which I discovered in, when I read Matthew 6.6, 6, which says, When you pray, go into your room, close the door. That's exactly what I had done, she said. This little experiment was just an attempt at prayer. And your Father, who is unseen who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. 
I had gotten that bit right. I had gone in. I had shut the door. I had prayed. I had sensed there was somebody who was unseen, but I never actually, I had never actually known that, although he was unseen, he was still seeing me. Isn't that good news? That's good news. Well, if this was a typical storybook, we'd turn the last page and read how everybody lived happily ever after. But this was real life, and it wasn't like that. Once Ishmael was born in that household, the tension with Sarai only increased, and it really got bad when her son, Isaac, was born 10 years later. The boys fought, the big one beating up on the little one. That was, Boy, with all that inborn hostility that God had promised, started that hostility that continues to this day. And despite his God-given name, Ishmael was the kind of kid that breaks a mother's heart. A wild donkey of a man, which means fierce and independent with stubborn pride and an untamable spirit. He's hostile to everybody. Later, Hagar was driven out of Abram's household again, again. And this time, she found herself in a wilderness with no water and thought she would die. And God met her once again and showed her a spring of water again and promised that her son, Ishmael, would not die, but in fact would be the father of a great nation of people. And so it is, for Ishmael is the father of the Arab world. Now, wouldn't it have been better if God would have just let Hagar go on just to go back to Egypt? Wouldn't that have been better? I mean, this was such a messy place. Why didn't he let her just go back? It wouldn't have been better. And here's an important truth. I couldn't think of a better way to put this than this. God's blessing hides in some dark corners. God's blessing hides in some dark corners. Why'd you have to go back to that mess? It was because the blessing of God rested on the household of Abram, as messy as that was. God's covenant was with Abram. For us, for you, and for me, God sees everyone everywhere. He hears every prayer. It's impossible to think of God not hearing a prayer. He may not respond in the same way, but God hears and sees everyone. But not all are under that umbrella, that, you know, better, those wings of the covenant of God. In order to be blessed by God, for sure, under his promise, we have to be under his covenant. For us, that means that we have to be hidden in Christ. In Christ is where the covenant of God protects us. It's a much safer refuge by far than Abraham's household ever was. You know, every time we take communion, which is that meal of fellowship with one another and with the Lord, what's said? Jesus is quoted, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. That's what we are in. That's where God blesses us. You will never be invisible. You will never be alone. You have God's word on it. There's another, one more piece of being in the covenant of God, in the protection, in the covering of God. And that's to be part of God's people. His household of faith, his church. 
The Bible has no knowledge. There's nowhere that the Bible talks about somebody who is alone, apart from the people of God, and experiences the blessing of God, the presence of God. Now, churches, just like Abraham's household, can really be messy places. You think you know that? You ought to be a pastor. Am I right, Pastor David? I don't mean this church in particular. I'm just meaning, generally speaking, churches can be messy, and they can be disappointing, and they can be hard. But the Lord Jesus meets us here. He meets us here. And we hear him here. And he sees us here. Well, to wrap up, that well, Pierre Lahai Roy, the well of the living one who sees me. You know that well is still there. That's it. That, it's out in the boondocks. It, you, you don't want to go without a couple bottles of water. It's way out there. But it's still there, and it, it works. A well is such a wonderful way of picturing the refreshing life that Jesus gives us in living water. What did he call it? A well of water springing up within us. Okay, so listen. First, this morning, if you feel invisible, if you feel unheard, if there's no human being that can get to that deep place in you, you listen to what God has said to you. God hears. God sees, and he offers you water to spring up within. How do I get that? Drink it. Ask for it. And then we submit our lives to God.